It is August 31st, 2008, and a medical helicopter is taking off from a local fundraising event just outside of Greenberg, Indiana. Suddenly, parts start to fly off of the helicopter just as it rapidly descends and crashes into the ground. What were those parts, and why did this happen? This and more on this episode of The Dr. Medic. See, this was a medical helicopter flown by Arivac Life Team. Arivac was a privately owned, tiny little company way back in 1985 when they first started, and they were based out of West Plains, Missouri. Over the past 35 years, they have grown tremendously, and now they have over 140 helicopters across 15 states and are a part of one of the largest air medical provider groups in the entire world called Global Medical Response. Arivac took a very unique approach when they started where they chose to focus the majority of their resources on a single aircraft type. In this case, the Bell 206 Long Ranger. Many other air medical providers might use all different types of aircraft across their fleet, ranging from Bell 206s to A-Star 350s, all the way up to big helicopters like EC-145s and the really big ones like an Augusta AW-139. Arivac chose the 206 for one of the same reasons that Southwest Airlines has chosen to only fly the Boeing 737, and that's efficiency. By having just a single airframe to base all of your aircraft on, the cost savings is huge when it comes to things like training, medical equipment, and parts and repairs. Yes, this has definitely changed as of today in 2022, where Arivac does fly a lot of Bell 407s and even has some EC-130s in their fleet, but the primary workhorse of their fleet is still the Bell 206. The Bell 206 is one of the most popular and safest aircraft ever made in the entire world. Between the original 206 Jet Ranger and the longer and more powerful Long Ranger, over 7,000 of these helicopters were built, with the very first aircraft rolling off the assembly line in 1962, and the very last one being delivered, ironically, to Arivac in 2017. With this many aircraft being built and flown all over the world, it should be safe to say that all of the bugs and defects of a new model would have been discovered and resolved decades ago. But as we'll see, even though a design could have been perfected many years ago, manufacturing processes can still cause problems. This particular aircraft in the accident was built in 1979 and had a Rolls-Royce Allison model 250C-30P turboshaft engine. This aircraft had 26,250 hours on the frame with 11,554 hours on the engine itself. It was last inspected by the FAA just 10 days before this accident on August 21st, 2008. The blades for this helicopter had 2,808 hours on them and still had almost 800 hours left in their service life. The accident pilot was a 43-year-old male who held a commercial pilot certificate with ratings for both rotorcraft helicopter and single-engine airplane. His certificate also included instrument ratings for both helicopters and airplanes. The pilot had worked for Arivac for just over two years, with his last check ride taking place just two months prior to the accident on June 10th. He had a total of 5,493 hours of total flight time, with 5,176 of them in helicopters and 1,915 hours on this type of aircraft. About a week before the accident, a maintenance discrepancy was documented that stated, while on approach, heard and felt a low rumble and vibration from the rear of the aircraft. The resulting maintenance inspection did not reveal any abnormalities. A ground run and flight check could not duplicate the write-up, nor did they identify any other discrepancies. There was no mention of a similar discrepancy in any of the maintenance records prior to this event as well. The accident helicopter was based out of Rushville, Indiana, which was about 18 miles north of the accident site. 
It was lunchtime and the weather was clear and warm with 10 knot winds. The crew was doing a local PR fundraising event at a local fire station that day. Here in the United States, especially across the Midwest part of the country, ground providers oftentimes have a choice as to what medical helicopter company they want to show up and transport their patient. So it's not uncommon for the flight crew, which usually consists of a single pilot, a flight paramedic, and a flight nurse, to fly out and visit with the local EMS, fire, and police agencies in their coverage area. They may be providing outreach education, give tours of the helicopter, they might be providing landing zone safety classes, or they might just simply be hanging out with ground providers, all in an effort to build relationships and do some networking. In this case, the PR event was a picnic at the Bernie Volunteer Fire Department. The crew arrived at this fundraising event at 11.50 hours in the morning and were all done by about 1,300 hours. They lifted off the ground at the PR event at about 13.17 and just a few moments later, witnesses on the ground stated that they began to see parts fly off of the helicopter when it suddenly began a rapid descent and crashed just a few minutes after takeoff. The helicopter crashed into a cornfield just 1.2 miles from the PR event. The fuselage came to rest nearly inverted and the entire cockpit and cabin areas were destroyed by impact forces and a post-impact fire. The crash occurred with such force that the transmission became separated from the airframe and came to rest almost 200 yards northeast of the main wreckage. At the accident site, investigators could quickly see that the main rotor blades were still attached to the hub. One of these blades was still fully intact, but the other blade was fractured into three separate pieces with the most inboard piece still attached to the hub. Both of the other sections of the blade were recovered from the accident site. Bernie Fire Department, which was the very place where the flight crew was just holding their PR event, responded and was on scene within just two minutes. But tragically, the pilot, the flight nurse, and the flight medic all died in this accident. All of the wreckage was recovered and transported to a hangar for investigation and analysis by the NTSB, Arivac Life Team, and Bell Helicopters. Based on the eyewitness testimony of parts flying off of the aircraft and that one of the rotor blades was separated into three sections, the investigators quickly began to focus their efforts on the main rotor blades. The rotor blades on the Bell 2R6 are a bonded assembly where there are several layers and skins wrapped around an aluminum honeycomb core and it's all bonded together with high strength adhesives. A full metallurgical examination was conducted on the fractured blade. There was a very clean and complete fracture that was found about 8 feet from the tip of the blade with another very irregular fracture found about another 3.5 feet inward from the first fracture. As you can see in the picture here, there is actually another section that makes it look like there were four sections, like it broke twice, but they actually had to cut the blade with a saw in the field in order to facilitate shipping and handling. Basically, the blade was too long and too big to be shipped by whatever means they were using, so they cut the blade here in this location. But they also needed the blade to be shortened a bit in order to facilitate the use of a scanning electron microscope later on in the investigation. Further examination of the blade revealed ratchet marks as well as fine elliptical clamshell marks, both of which are consistent with fatigue cracking. Now, even without the use of a microscope, you can clearly see the clamshell marks here and the crack clearly emanated from inside the blade between the leading edge and the upper wall. The crack propagated upwards and actually encompassed about 50% of the cross section of the blade before the entire blade failed and fractured. Utilizing the scanning electron microscope, investigators were able to narrow it down and isolate a single pore on the inner surface of the blade spar. The crack that ultimately fractured this blade and caused three fatalities actually emanated from this tiny single spot on the blade. Now, remember I said that the Bell 206 has been around for many decades and it's one of the safest aircraft to have ever been built? 
well, how could this have happened? On this aircraft, with 7,000 of them in existence, this means there would have been tens of thousands of these blades made and used over the last 50 years without any similar incidents like this. Well, on the outside of the blade, there was no evidence of corrosion or any previous mechanical damage, so it was pretty easy to rule out that some external force had caused this failure. Remember I said that these blades are bonded? That they are made of several layers and then basically nuclear glued together? Well, the outer wall of the blade is made of aluminum, but to add mass to the rotating structure, lead weights are added to the inside of the blade spar and they run the length of the blade. This lead weight is held in place by adhesive placed in between the weight and the main spar of the blade. When investigators located the origin of the fatigue crack that I just previously mentioned, they also noticed that there was a large void or empty space in the adhesive between the inside surface of the spar and the lead weight. This void was over nine inches in length and extended in both directions from the original crack. Bell noted that excessive voids between the main spar and the lead weight can lead to a fatigue failure in these blades, such as what occurred in this incident. In short, this blade failed because there was a void in this adhesive during the manufacturing process, and this void allowed too much stress to be placed upon the blade during normal operation, which ultimately led to a crack forming which eventually made its way all the way through the blade, fracturing the blade completely, which finally led to this aircraft crashing. As a result of the investigation, and almost a full year later, Bell Helicopters did release an alert service bulletin in July of 2009, which included all of the affected airframe models as well as all of the blades affected based by serial number. This was a major service bulletin and a huge undertaking that affected aircraft from all over the world. If the conditions were met by the bulletin, all the affected blades had to actually be removed from the aircraft and then x-rayed in the affected areas. All of the radiographs would then be sent back to Bell Helicopters for their review. If the blade was found to have a crack, then Bell would replace the affected blade. If the blade did not have a crack, then the blade would have to be physically checked by hand with a recurring blade spar wipe check for a crack every 60 engine starts for the remainder of the life of that blade. Upon completion of the investigation, the NTSB found that the probable cause for this accident was the in-flight separation of a main rotor blade due to a fatigue failure of the blade spar rendering the helicopter uncontrollable and the manufacturer's production of main rotor blades with latent manufacturing defects, which precipitated the fatigue failure of the blade spar. This is one of the very few cases where everyone involved with operating this helicopter seemed to do everything right. They checked the aircraft as they were supposed to, they seemed to be following all of the rules and adhered to all of the manufacturer and the operator guidelines. But due to a manufacturing defect, these three people tragically lost their lives. Now, there were news reports that a lawsuit was filed on behalf of the flight nurse. There's typically lawsuits filed after every aviation crash. And I normally would not bring this up during any of my videos, but while researching this accident, I did find a very interesting accusation in some of the lawsuit paperwork. Remember that maintenance discrepancy that I told you about that occurred just a few days before the accident where it was documented that a low rumble or vibration could be heard from the rear of the aircraft? Well, if you recall, the mechanics and the pilots were unable to duplicate this issue. But at one point, the attorney for the flight nurse accused Rolls-Royce, the engine manufacturer for this aircraft, of failing to warn operators that a low rumble or vibration from the rear of the aircraft was not engine related but could signify an impending fatigue fracture of the main rotor blade. Now, I scoured all over my sources for more information on this and was unable to confirm that this is a known issue or if Rolls-Royce has ever issued a service bulletin on this. This specific issue was not addressed in the NTSB report, and I was unable to locate any final records of the proposed lawsuit. If you are a 206 pilot, 
or a mechanic and have heard of such an issue where Rolls-Royce knew that this vibration can be due to an impending fracture of the main rotor blade, please send me a DM or an email or something like that with some info as I would be very interested to learn more about that topic. While the cause of this accident was clearly a defect in Bell's manufacturing process, I do commend Bell for cooperating and participating in the lengthy investigation and releasing a service bulletin that clearly acknowledges the manufacturing issues so that they could quickly identify and replace any other defective parts in order to prevent further accidents or further loss of life. I do thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video. As with all accidents, there is always something that we can learn. What did you learn from this video? If you learned something, let me know in the comments below. Please feel free to throw me a like and a subscription. Cheers to you all, and I do hope that you all have a beautiful rest of your day.